Uh, we are beginning the book of Micah, which is in the Old Testament, that very well-worn section you're all familiar with, known as the Minor Prophets. And so we are going to spend the next several weeks looking at the book of Micah. It's only seven chapters. Uh, we won't be going line up online, verse by verse. Rather, we'll probably go take a chapter at a time, uh, one chapter, maybe one or two weeks, and then we'll move on to the next chapter. But what I wanted to do with you this morning was to give you an overview or a foundation for understanding not just Micah, but all of the books of the Old Testament, particularly when it comes to the prophets. Uh, now, just to refresh us as we uh, go through this, let's uh, take a minute or two to discuss a little bit about Micah, and then we'll jump back into where we left off the last time. Uh, Micah is the author of the book that we're about to study. Origin is from Moresheth, Gath. Um, it's actually Moresheth. It's about 25 miles south and to the west of Jerusalem. So if you have uh, orientation to this, this would be Jerusalem there in the center part of the map and the red star is where Moresheth Gath. The reason they call it Moresheth Gath is because Gath was the next largest city uh, closest to Moresheth uh, and everyone knew where Gath was. The reason being, it was a very popular town, Goliath was from Gath. Uh, so it was very well known to Micah's contemporaries. Uh, speaking of contemporaries, Micah had three prophet contemporaries, uh, probably the most famous being Isaiah, uh, and then also Hosea and Amos. Uh, Micah wrote before the Israelite captivity. Uh, the ten northern tribes were taken away in 722 B.C., and so that's uh, Micah prophesied just a little bit before uh, the ten northern tribes were taken away into captivity. Now, Micah 1 tells us that he ministered and served during the time of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. As you can see, those are kings to the south. That is, they were kings of Judah. Uh, the ten northern tribes, their capital was Samaria. Uh, the capital of the southern kingdom was Jerusalem. Now, Micah was written both to Israel and Judah though the majority of the book that you'll see once we begin it will deal with uh, the southern kingdom. That is, it will deal more with Judah than with Israel. Uh, they were going to fall under temporal judgment, which is why most of the prophets write to uh, Israel and Judah. And the reason they were going to fall into temporal judgment is for violating the terms of the Mosaic Covenant. Uh, Micah also contains... Uh, very copious information regarding the Millennial Kingdom. Uh, so we'll see that once we get to the little bit later on in the book. And it'll also discuss the birthplace of the Messiah. We'll see that in Micah 5, chapter 2, uh, that Bethlehem would be the place uh, for Israel's king to be born. And Micah is a book, ultimately, of hope. Now, what I want us to do is put Micah in a box in your mind real quick and then ask the question, how does Micah relate to the other books in the story of the Bible? Now, to do that, we, we're going to need an anchor, a central theme, if you will, for understanding the book. Uh, you said, or we've discussed this last time, that many people said uh, that there are various main themes of the Bible, and if we look at that, some people would say the Bible is a book of love. That's the central theme of the Bible. Uh, promise, redemption, salvation, uh, that it's a book about God's attributes. All of those things would be correct, but all of those things fall under the heading of the kingdom of God. The Bible begins speaking about a kingdom the Bible ends with the inauguration of a new kingdom that is a new heaven and a new earth. Even Tony Evans in his uh, book, The Kingdom Agenda, writes, quote, The unifying central theme throughout the Bible is the glory of God and the advancement of His kingdom. The conjoining thread from Genesis to Revelation from beginning to end is focused on one thing, God's glory through the advancing kingdom. Uh, Dr. Pentecost Dwight Pentecost, who was also a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, uh, 
in his book, Thy Kingdom Come, writes, quote, The great theme of God's kingdom program can be found throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. It is the theme that unifies all of Scripture. I covered this with my students this past week as kind of looking at subsections of the Bible and is, is there an easy way to remember the Bible in terms of having it in your own mind? Well, I gave them a list of about 20 things. And I suppose if you had to regurgitate that on a test, you could spend a few hours or days memorizing that and then giving it back or regurgitating it back on a test. But there's actually an easier way to really look at the overarching story of the Bible. There's five headings. Those of you who have been expositors for a while will remember these. For those of you who haven't, this would be a good way for you to remember so that if someone were to ask you at lunch or when you're at work, hey, what is this book called the Bible? What does it tell us? It's a story of creation. We see that in Genesis 1 and 2. It accounts for man's fall, that is, how man became unplugged spiritually from God. We see that in Genesis 3. And then it talks about a promise, Genesis 3.15, where Satan tells, uh, or excuse me, God tells Satan that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. That you would bruise his heel, but he would bruise your head. That is the first mention of the gospel that we find in the scripture that's in Genesis 3.15. And then beginning with Genesis 3.16 all the way to the end of Malachi in the Old Testament, uh, we have the outworking of this promise, this conflict, this cosmic conflict between the seed of the woman, ultimately, and the seed of Satan. We see this conflict ultimately uh, ending on the cross in terms of the spiritual uh, victory of Christ over Satan. Uh, when he died upon the cross for the sins of the world, atoning for man's sin, purchasing his church, and uh, that occurred, if Dr. Harold Horner is correct in his estimations, on Friday, April the 3rd, 33 A.D. at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, the reference for that is the Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ by Dr. Harold Honer. And then from that moment forward, uh, we find data, which is contained here in the Gospels and the Epistles, uh, telling us, that is, those who were spiritually a part of Christ's kingdom, how we should live, how we should act, and the mission that we have in fulfilling this kingdom agenda, uh, which ultimately ends with restoration, that is, a new heaven and a new earth in Revelation 21 and 22. So the kingdom of God is the major emphasis on Scripture. Uh, Dr. Michael Vlock, in his book, He Will Reign Forever, writes, quote, the kingdom of God is the thread that runs from the first chapter of the Bible to the last. Again, he's mirroring and mimicking the same things told to us by Dr. Evans in Pentecost. The story begins with God is king and man's right to rule under him. It then culminates with God on the throne and man reigning under him over the earth. God's kingdom program involves five major parts or developments. And what are they? Again, it's creation, fall, promise, redemption, and restoration. That is a summary of the Bible in under five headings. The whole story centers or concentrates on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, because after all, history is His story. So, what is the means that God uses to bring this kingdom about? You see, that's where the debate really comes in. That's where the question really comes in. Well, how does God, in the culmination of His plan, bring all of these things to fruition? He does so by means of biblical covenants. Biblical covenants. And all of these we find mentioned in the Old Testament. So that's half your battle right there, just knowing where they are. They are in the Old Testament. Now, what is a covenant? A covenant, fundamentally, is an unconditional or conditional agreement between two or more parties. Uh, there are three kinds or types of common covenants mentioned in Scripture. Uh, we have the shoe covenant, which we find in the book of Ruth, uh, the salt covenant, and the blood covenant. The ones that we're mostly concerned with this morning for the purposes of the kingdom of God will be the blood covenant. Now, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and the New Covenant, something we find again in the Old Testament, are all blood covenants. As a matter of fact, uh, the first covenant in the Bible, which is the Noahic covenant, named after Noah, 
uh, provides for us the precondition of and the stability for all of our other subsequent covenants that are revealed in the Scripture. So the foundational covenant that we find in Scripture that is foundational for everything else that is revealed in Scripture by means of a covenant is established here with a, uh, God's covenant with Noah. You see, you thought it was just about flood and a rainbow. It's, it is that, but it is way much more than that. Uh, for example, God promises in the Noahic covenant that He will maintain the earth, the seasons, and the climates. That God will maintain the earth, the seasons, and the climate, climates. In Genesis chapter 8, for example, verse 21, after the flood subsides, Noah builds uh, an altar and offers uh, uh, an offering to God. And Moses, who writes the book of Genesis, says in verse 21, And the Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and wind and day and night Watch this, shall not cease. Implication, we don't have to worry about the earth ending in 12 years due to global warming. That's the implication of the statement. God will maintain the earth seasons and the climates. Uh, again, God will never again destroy the world by flooding. You see that in Genesis 9-11. He says, I will establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood, neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. That is, in the time of Noah's flood, um, if you take a literalist view of interpretation, which I do, uh, then the entire earth was flooded. God promises that he will never again destroy the earth by means of water. Now, it doesn't say that God, again, will never destroy the earth. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 makes it abundantly clear that God is going to refashion this world using a means of destruction, namely fire, to refashion it. Uh, but He just won't ever do it again through water. Uh, the sign of the covenant, that is the Noahic covenant, is the rainbow. We see this in Genesis 9 verse 12. God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations. I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. So every time we see the rainbow, it is a, uh, a, a symbol demonstrating the promise that God made to man to never destroy the earth again. Uh, all meat, as a result of the Noahic covenant, was available to eat. That is, all meat, all animals were given over for food. When God created Adam and Eve, at first they were to eating fruits and vegetables and those kinds of things. Uh, but now, as a result of the Noahic covenant, man is free to eat anything. Uh, we don't come to food or dietary restrictions again until we come in a, into the Mosaic covenant, where the children of Israel were restricted from eating things like cheeseburgers and shellfish and those kinds of things. But from that moment, that is when God stipulated those terms in the Mosaic Covenant, all the way back to the institution of the Noahic Covenant, uh, they were free to eat anything that they chose. So he notes, Genesis 9-3, Every moving thing that is available or alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. So they're not, they're not able to eat the blood boudin here. That's the only restriction. Uh, God also instituted, by way of the Noahic Covenant, capital punishment. He said, And I will require the blood of anyone who takes another person's life. If a wild animal kills a person, it must die, and anyone who murders a fellow human must die. If anyone takes a, a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands, for God made human beings in His own image. You say, why is 
capital punishment appear to just show up here and be so very extreme. And again, the reasoning is, is because there is a criminal facet of it, and it is reflected in a, a lot of man's laws that we have today. Uh, but also, God viewed it as an attack upon God himself. Why? Because man is the imago Dei. That is, he's in the image and likeness of God. So an attack upon man, God views that as an attack upon himself at least from the creaturely perspective. I'm not equating the creature with a creator, but I'm saying there is uh, certain similarities that he has that God views as being uh, extremely important to him. Uh, Dr. Alan Ross notes, In essence, this covenant, that is the Noahic covenant, was established to ensure the stability of nature. It helped guarantee the order of the world, People would also learn that human law was necessary for stability of life and that wickedness should not go unchecked as it had before. And so human government was brought in. So what we're saying here then is the Noahic covenant provides the, the precondition or the foundation for every other covenant that we find in Scripture. Again, why? Because God is maintaining the times, the earth, the seasons, and the epochs. Now, from the Noahic Covenant, the next covenant that we'll come across in the Bible is the Abrahamic Covenant. We see this over in Genesis chapter 12. Here, God comes to Abram, uh, as he was known at this time, in the land of the uh, Ur of the Chaldees, and he tells him that he wants him to leave his father, leave his family, and leave his land, and, and he will take him to a new land. He will make a promise with him, uh, in which he promised to him land, seed, that is descendants, and blessing. Now when God came to Abram at this time, Abram had no children. Abram, just to show you what kind of sense of humor God has, Abram means exalted father. So if you were to walk up to Abram and say, hey, how many kids do you have? None. That's the pun. When Abraham gets his name changed to Abraham, it means father of many. And of course, Abraham will eventually have Isaac and Jacob, and so he's only got two kids and yet father of many. Uh, ultimately, we know that uh, God is viewing not just his physical descendants, but also his spiritual descendants uh, by this. Now, the Abrahamic covenant promises, again, national land, uh, blessing, uh, both physical redemption and blessing for Abraham's descendants, as well as spiritual de -bless uh, blessing, and also uh, many, many descendants. Uh, this Abrahamic covenant, which all Abraham knew was land, seed, and blessing, is further expanded upon when God tells the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 30 that ultimately they're going to be taken away into captivity. They're going to be captive for roughly 70 years. We know that from the book of Jeremiah, at which time the children of Israel will re return to the land. And ultimately, God says there's, that there's going to be a scattering and an ultimate return at some point in the future. And that future is still future for us in terms of when and how God is going to do that. But he promises them a land, a geographic boundary for land, uh, and as such, that is irrevocable. So what we can tell our Palestinian friends over there uh, in terms of their saying they have the land, Israel is saying, no, it's our land. Well, let's go back and look at the title deed of the land. It is given to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Israel belongs to the Jews. Israel belongs to the Jews. So in this Palestinian covenant, again, this land covenant, and the reason they call it the Palestinian Covenant has nothing to do with Yasser Arafat or the Palestinians that currently live there. It's simply the land of Palestine. And so God promised them that the nation would be plucked from the land, that there would be a future repentance of Israel and ultimately a restoration to the land, and that Messiah would ultimately return and rule and reign from the land. Again, those things are still future to us. Now, Another facet of the covenant that is brought forth from the Abrahamic covenant is the Davidic covenant. Uh, we see this over in 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is where God promises David that he will have a descendant who shall succeed him and establish his kingdom. 
Now we know Solomon was the one who would succeed David. Some facets of this promise are made about Solomon, and then there are some facets of the promise that relate to ultimately David's ultimate son, which would be the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, how do we know ultimately that Christ is David's son? Because when we come to the New Testament in the book of Luke, Gabriel the angel comes to Mary, says that, hey, look, you're going to have a child. His name is going to be Jesus, or the Lord saves. He will save his people from their sins, and he will sit on the throne of his father David, making the connection back to this, this covenant, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And so we learn that the land seed blessing given to Abraham is further expanded upon under this particular covenant, that is the Davidic covenant, that it was going to be a descendant of David. And from this descendant, uh, who would ultimately we know to be the Lord Jesus Christ, he will sit on an eternal or perpetual throne in a kingdom. And this throne or kingdom will not be taken from him. Now, and then there's a third facet of the expansion of the Abrahamic covenant that we might call the new covenant. We see this over in Jeremiah 31, 31. Uh, this is the promise of a renewed heart and a renewed mind. Now, this promise is made to Israel. This is one of the covenants, though, that is shared by what we might call the church. In other words, those of us, we come into new faith and new life through belief and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who gives us a new heart and a new spirit. So this is one facet of a promise that is made specifically to the nation of Israel, but we share in by nature of our relationship with and to the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the covenant promise? Uh, a regenerated heart, a regenerated mind, the forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. And so the question then becomes, okay, we've talked about the Palestinian covenant or the land covenant and then the Davidic covenant and then the new covenant. But one we haven't mentioned is the Mosaic covenant. Why is that? Because all of those promises that we saw back, you know, the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Palestinian, uh, the new covenant and the Davidic covenant, all of those are unconditional Remember I said when it comes to a covenant, you have two kinds, a conditional covenant and an unconditional covenant. All of those promises are unconditional, meaning man doesn't have to do anything in order for those promises to come to fruition. The only covenant that we find there in terms of it being conditional was the Mosaic covenant. Dr. Bill Barrick, who is a professor of Old Testament at the Master's Seminary, writes, quote, the Mosaic Covenant was the most conditional of all the covenants. And like all the covenants, it promised blessing for obedience and curses for disobedience. The covenant addressed itself to Israel and to Israel alone with its divinely authoritative rules that stipulated standards of righteousness. They recall that the children of Israel are uh, slaves in Egypt. Moses comes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And through a trial of ten plagues, um, uh, Moses finally gets the children of Israel released. Abram, uh, or, uh, Pharaoh finally says, okay, look, your people can go. And so God brings them out into the desert and he institutes a covenant with them at Mount Sinai. There in this covenant, we see a presentation that is God giving the covenant then we see God giving prescriptions, that is, the do's and the don'ts of the covenant. And then he also gives the penalties for the covenant. All of this is done in Deuteronomy chapter 28. The covenant um, was written in a common legal form of the day. Today, if you were to try to sit down and read some type of contractual agreement between two parties or two companies, uh, for the most part, you would have to have a law degree to understand the wherefore and the whither twos and all these other things. Um, but in the time of Moses' day, the treaty of the Mosaic Covenant, or the promise of the Mosaic Covenant as presented in treaty form, was written according to something that was common to nations and people groups at the time, which was the Hittite Treaty Format. Uh, Dr. Paul Enns, in 
His uh, Moody Handbook of Theology writes, quote, The pattern of the covenant follows the form of the ancient suzerain vassal treaty. Uh, by that, what he's talking about is you would have a king. A king would come to a people group, and you may have seen this in the 300 movie with, uh, where uh, the guy gets kicked off into the well or whatever. For, uh, he's the messenger who comes to King Leonidas. Uh, what would basically happen is emissaries would come to a people with an army and so forth, and they'll say, look, if you pay homage to the king, uh, there'll be certain stipulations. You'll have to give tribute to the king and so forth. But if you do that, you can still be your own kingdom. You can still have your own people and so forth, but you will have to pay tribute to the king. Basically, the king becomes a puppet king. And so what happens is that God, following the format of the suzerain vassal, says, if you, as the people, promise to do A, B, C, and D, then there's going to be good things that will happen, and these are what those good things are. If you don't do those things, then this is what's going to happen, E, F, and G, and that's not going to be good for you. And so the children of Israel said, you know, it sounds like a pretty good deal. I think that's something that we might want to do. And so what happens is the blessings of the covenant in terms of God providing for them and giving them good things was all conditional. For example, in Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, it says, Now it, it shall be that if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all His commandments which I command you today, the Lord, will God, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. So, sounds like a pretty good deal. I mean, God's going to be protecting over us. He's going to watch for, for over us. He's going to give us good things. That, that's a good deal. So then we see the prescriptions uh, down in verse 7 and following. You see, obedience to God would bring security and prosperity to Israel. Now, in verse 3 of chapter 24 of Exodus, we find this. Uh, Moses went down to the people and repeated all the instructions and the regulations the Lord had given him. And all the people answered with one voice. So, so Moses is like the mediator between God and man. And he's telling the people, look, these are going to be everything that God's going to hold us accountable to. And the people said, everything that uh, God commands will do. Then Moses carefully wrote down all the Lord's instructions. Early the next morning, Moses got up and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and he set up twelve pillars, one for each of the twelve tribes of Israel. And then he sent some of the young Israelite men to present burnt offerings and to sacrifice bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. And Moses drained half of the blood from these animals into basins. The other half he splattered against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it aloud to the people. Again, they all responded, We will do everything the Lord has commanded. We will obey. Then Moses took the blood from the basins and splattered it over the people. Now, obviously, you have three million something Jews out there. He's not covering everyone in blood, but probably the first three or four, four rows that were above him as he sprinkled the people probably got blood splattered over them. And so he splattered it on the people, declaring, Look, this blood confirms the covenant the Lord has made with you and giving you these instructions. So now the people have bound themselves to God, and God has bound Himself to the children of Israel to the exclusion of every other people group in the world on the basis of a conditional blood covenant. Again, what are the blessings? God promised them, and the people knew it. He promised protection from enemies, material prosperity. Your clothes are not going to wear out for 40 years. You're going to have a holy reputation among the nations, prosperity in the land, reign and financial stability, and you'll be known as a leading nation among the peers that you have, your neighbors. MacArthur notes, adherence to the Mosaic Covenant was the means through which Israel could stay connected to the blessings of the Abrahamic Covenant. Sometimes students will ask, so, so if, 
the Mosaic covenant is conditional, and yet the Abrahamic covenant is unconditional. How does those two things work together in terms of Israel experiencing the blessings that God is putting out in the promises? That's, an, that's a great question. The Mosaic covenant was given so that the children of Israel could, um, could experience the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is not going to be filled through Israel's promises uh, that were given to them through Moses, but they could experience certain blessings from it. The Abrahamic covenant is going to be fulfilled by God. Man has to do nothing. The Mosaic covenant was given so that the children of Israel could temporarily and at that moment experience the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant temporally if, and a big if, they were to obey. Because God put the penalties in as well. Disobedience to God, because you bound yourself to God by means of this agreement. Temporal judgments and curses. And there was also a progression of these judgments leading ultimately to exile. God said, if you disobey me, you can experience destruction and disease. You will experience drought. You will experience defeat in battle. You will experience physical and mental illness among the people group. You will experience oppression and crime. God is saying, if you don't want to live my way, where you live is going to be turned into a hellhole. Something just seems to set me off on the inside saying, are we experiencing things like that today? If you reject me, I'll give you exactly what you want. I'll turn you over to exactly what you want. But I digress. Ultimately, God says, if you disobey me and you keep disobeying me, then you will be exiled. You will be taken away by a people group whose language you do not understand. The Assyrians came down and took the ten northern tribes captive to which they never returned in 722 under Sennacherib. The southern tribe of Judah lasted a little bit longer till 586 until they were ultimately taken away into Babylonian captivity. What we see when we see Micah is right before the ten northern tribes are taken away into captivity. He will beg to the people. He will plead with the people. Come back. Tear down the high places. Repent. Get in good relationship with God. Based upon what? Based upon the promises of the Mosaic Covenant. That's the agreement that God held them to. That's the agreement that they knew and that they understood. But that's the agreement that they intentionally violated. Time and time and time and time again. Now, what does it mean to the grand scheme of things in terms of these covenants and promises in the Old Testament? That is, Israel's disobedience? Ultimately, nothing. Why? Because those promises, not the Mosaic Covenant, but because the Noahic Covenant, the Abrahamic Covenant, the Palestinian or Land Covenant, the Davidic Covenant, the New Covenant, man has to do nothing to enjoy the benefits of of those promises. All of them find their fruition, that is their fulfillment, in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the question sometimes it pops up is, well, well so what about us? Why are we no longer under this Mosaic Covenant? What does the Mosaic Covenant mean for us sitting in Southeast Texas in the year 2022, when we go back and look at the Bible and see what God did with the children of Israel here, why don't we participate in that? Well, the re reason, and there are several of them, the first would be that Christ's death put an end to the Mosaic Law. Christians and the New Testament are not under law, but rather we are under grace. Paul says this in Romans 6.14. For sin shall not be master over you. There he's using a collective pronoun, 
so I could translate it y'all, second person plural. For sin shall not be master over y'all, for y'all are not under law, but under grace. Dr. Earl Radmacher notes, the Mosaic system consisted of external laws which revealed the sin prevalent in human hearts. In contrast, God's grace places the believer in Christ and the Holy Spirit in the believer. Therefore, a Christian does not have to sin. He or she can resist temptation and do what is right. So Christ put an end to the Mosaic law by His death. Moreover, since Christ fulfilled every aspect of the law by His person and work, Christians in the era of grace are no longer under that law. We are under a new law. We walk by the means of the Holy Spirit through faith, being led by Him and not under the Mosaic law. Paul labors this over in Galatians 5 when he said, But if you were led by the Spirit, you were not under the law. Don Campbell notes, In summary, what Paul emphasized is that a godly life is not lived under the rules of the law, but is a life led by the Spirit. Justification is not possible by works, so, so sanctification cannot be achieved by human effort. By sanctification, he's talking about our daily life and growth process in the Christian life. He notes, this, of course, does not mean that a Christian is totally passive. In either case, for the response of faith is necessary, faith in Christ to save and in the Holy Spirit to sanctify. That is, to grow up in the faith. Also, if we look back at the Mosaic Law, in, a, in addition to guiding the principles that Israel should live under in terms of religious, ceremony, and their criminal laws, the Mosaic Covenant also contains civil laws governing Israel's political and social society. They had an income tax-based system there. You know what it was? Tithing. Tithing was the way that the Israelites, under the Mosaic Law, gathered taxes. As such, the Mosaic Covenant was never intended by God to be the universal law for all people for all time. Moreover, the Mosaic Covenant, as law, no longer has any bearing over us because its demands have been fully met in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the question and then is begged is, so why are the, uh, Israel's ten northern tribes in Judah and the southern kingdom in trouble with God? Answer, because Micah, going back to our study of Micah, the prophet, Micah declared that the people of Israel disobeyed the Mosaic covenant and judgment was pending. Up until the point when Micah is proclaiming and pronouncing judgment upon Samaria, which is the capital of Israel, and also Judah, or Jerusalem, which is the capital of Judah, there is time for them to turn. Micah begins his ministry sometime around 750 B.C. The ten northern tribes aren't taken into captivity until 722 B.C., so that's 20-something years there, or, or better. But they do not repent. They do not repent. So why is all this important within the Bible's outworking, the big picture narrative? Again, because the Bible begins with a kingdom, the Bible closes with a kingdom. I would also add that if we look at the progressive outworking of the Bible, there's really only one logical conclusion that it can come to. If you understand the covenants, the promises, and the various epics and how God is dealing with the outworking of His plan both for Israel and the church, it can lead really only to one answer. For example, and here's we'll close with this, we have the foundation. The foundation of actually a, a view of Scripture referred to as premillennialism. Premillennialism. Because premillennialism deals with a kingdom. We see that God initiates a kingdom and He places man over the kingdom, Genesis chapter 1. And He pronounces, let them rule, let them exercise dominion, speaking of Adam and Eve and all of their progeny. But we know that that doesn't take long before that program gets halted. 
You also have several Old Testament passages that predict a future kingdom. Uh, all one needs to do is go and read certain passages in Isaiah, some in the Psalms in reference to the Messianic Psalms and so forth, uh, and, and you'll understand that the Jews in Israel were expecting a literal, physical kingdom to be led by their Messiah. And they still expect that. We also have certain Old Testament passages that predict an intermediate state or what we might call an intermediate kingdom. When does that happen? Well, we know that we're currently living in this particular facet of the outworking of God's program now. It's not very nice here. We call this the church age, right? The church age is, is advancing. The kingdom of God is advancing one heart at a time, one soul at a time, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The next phase on God's calendar is what we might call the millennial kingdom ultimately, which will happen where Christ will return. He'll rule and reign 1,000 years from Jerusalem. Where do we find that being predicted? All one needs to do is look at what Jesus has taught in reference to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verses, uh, chapters 5 through 7. Uh, what he taught in Revelation, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 24 and 25 in reference to the coming kingdom and the judgments associated with that kingdom. And then one ultimately needs to look no further than Revelation chapter 20, where six times in one chapter it is said that Christ will return to the earth and that he will rule and reign for 1,000 years. But that's not the good part, although that is the good part. The good news is that we will rule and reign with Him. That's the good news. That's the good part. And that after that 1,000 year kingdom, we will go into the eternal state. The eternal kingdom. Where again, we will rule and reign with Him. And we will be able to fully, free from any sin, and any sin nature, to know God more then we know about anything and we will delight in Him finally more than we delight in anything else. That's the framework for understanding 